Hello, my friends. I'm delighted today to speak to two very important influencers in both the world of science and the world of culture. And uh, it's my very special privilege to speak with uh, Nancy Ellen Abrams and Joel Premack. I'm holding their books in my hand. The first one here, The View from the Center of the Universe, which I first read a few years ago. And uh, this gave me the opportunity of meeting both Joel Premack and Nancy Abrams. And now this wonderful book also, The New Universe and the Human Future. So thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for inviting us. Yeah. It's always fun to talk with you. And thanks, Nancy, for also joining. Um, I will direct a few questions first uh, at Joel and then at you, Nancy, and then we'll just see where we go from there. I'm totally fascinated by your work. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the world should be much more aware of uh, these amazing insights from both these books, the view from the center of the universe the new universe and the human future. So as I'm going through this book, um, I actually um, you know, have a few questions just for the general public, because general public is not familiar with these terms. And Joel, you being the author of the Double Dark Theory, uh, please tell our audience, most of the people don't understand science, but that's been my job to try and uh, bring science uh, to the general public as as best I can by speaking to people like yourselves. So the most astonishing thing that I find in both of these books is, um, I'll start with this particular table. Mm -hmm. The cosmic uh, density pyramid, we call it. Yeah, which where you say, um, all other visible atoms, 0.01% of the universe. Uh, do you mean all 2 trillion galaxies and 700 sextillion stars and uncountable, possibly even many habitable, habitable planets is just 0.01%? Not quite. Uh, the 0.01% is the heavy elements, heavier than hydrogen and helium, carbon, oxygen, uh, iron, uh, all of those elements that are so crucial for life beyond hydrogen, uh, all of them are made in stars or in stellar processes, and they represent a very tiny fraction of the universe, about 0.01%, a hundredth of a percent. Uh, that's the fancy uh, elements, the ones that aren't just the two lightest elements, hydrogen and helium. Yeah, but the hydrogen and helium is invisible interstellar dust. Almost all of it. Uh, it it's uh, actually a plasma. It's it's ionized and it's in between the galaxies. And so it uh, doesn't emit light and it doesn't absorb light, most of it. Uh, all the stuff that we can see, all the visible stars and all of those uh, hundreds of billions or trillions of galaxies, uh, that's about a half of 1% of cosmic density. Uh, the, the stuff in between the galaxies, the, the plasma, the hydrogen and helium that, that we can't easily see, that makes up about 5%. So there's a lot of it comparatively to what we can see. Uh, what we see is only a 10th of the hydrogen and helium and the heavy elements. Uh, but the vast majority of the universe is made of two mysterious things that we call dark matter and dark energy. We know a great deal about how they work. We can describe them, uh, what their physical properties are, uh, but we don't know what they are. And we don't know why there's so much of them compared to so little of the stuff that we're familiar with. So- uh, Why don't you explain to the general public what is dark matter in your view? And then what is dark energy? So what we, what we tried in the early days uh, of trying to understand how the universe worked was assuming that the dark matter is either moving very rapidly in the early universe, we call that hot dark matter, moving very sluggishly in the early universe, we call that cold dark matter, and in between, that would be warm dark matter. And 
we worked out what the universe would look like with each of these different possibilities. And it very quickly became clear that hot dark matter, we, we understand what hot dark matter could be. It could be neutrinos, a kind of uh, uh, particle that physicists are quite familiar with. Uh, but it turns out that that uh, that doesn't produce a universe anything like what we see. Uh, it would not make galaxies until fairly late. It would make clusters of galaxies early. But that's exactly the opposite of what we see. Clusters are still forming today. Galaxies are mostly pretty old. So uh, it was sort of a puzzle how to solve that problem. And uh, I figured out that we could have more massive particles, what, which are today called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. And uh, it's kind of a nice acronym, WIMPs, because it suggests that uh, they uh, don't have much effect on us. They uh, uh, couldn't hurt us very much. Uh, our picture makes it likely that millions of wimps are actually going through us all the time, going through Earth. But they hardly affect us at all, except gravitationally. Uh, and that's why we call them weakly interacting massive particles. Uh, Has anyone ever seen or documented a wimp? No. At least we don't have unambiguous evidence. We have evidence that might be indirect uh, uh, evidence for WIMPs, but we don't have any direct evidence. We don't know what it is. Why do we call it matter? Because it has gravity. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand that whatever the dark matter is, as long as it's moving very sluggishly in the early universe, uh, it will have very similar properties. We know that we need to have a great deal of it. It's about 25% of the mass of the universe. About 5% is ordinary matter, mostly hydrogen and helium. About 25% is this mysterious dark matter. And the other 70% is something even more mysterious that we call dark energy. It might be that the dark energy is just a property of space. Uh, Einstein suggested that that might be possible. It, it was something that easily could fit into his theory of general relativity. He cooked up general relativity. He finally had the whole picture right in November of, 20, of 1915. And then the next year or so, he applied it to the universe and realized that the universe couldn't be static. It has to either be expanding or contracting. And he was worried about that because he had no evidence that the universe was expanding or contracting. So he figured out that if you put in a kind of a repulsion of space by space, dark energy, we call it, uh, that would, on average, counteract the gravitational attraction of matter. And he thought maybe you could get a static universe that way. Turns out it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that the universe is not homogeneous. There are regions like where we are on Earth, which are enormously more dense, about 10 to the 30 times more dense than the average density of the universe. The universe is very, very low density on average. But because it's got high density regions, they would collapse and make galaxies and clusters and groups of galaxies and so on. And in between those, if we had this cosmological constant kind of dark energy, just a property of space, uh, space would expand faster and faster. And that's the way the universe actually looks. So Einstein actually invented this idea. Then when the universe was discovered to be expanding by Edwin Hubble in 1929, Einstein said that it was his greatest blunder to have suggested this cosmological constant idea that the universe might have a cosmic repulsion of space by space. But it's turning out that uh, uh, that is exactly what the universe looks like. It could be that this dark energy is more complicated. It could be that it's something that was different in the past, that'll be different in the future. It might even disappear or even change sign. But it's not E is equal to mc squared. It's not that energy. It's an anti-gravity force, right? Uh, it has a dual nature. It has a density, the dark energy. So you might think, oh, in that case, it would attract just like ordinary matter attracts gravitationally. But in addition to having this positive attractive nature, it has a much stronger negative repulsive nature. Uh, it has what's called technically negative uh, uh, attraction. 
so uh, it 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 was something that Einstein realized you could add to the theory in a uh, in a way that you know makes it a perfectly natural thing to do. Uh, why it's there, we don't know. In okay, fact, I it's a general more fact more about uh, the the whole picture. I have Both picture. Go, go ahead. I have two more questions on this, and then I want to get to Nancy. Well, what, one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that what we have both in particle physics, which I worked on many years ago, and in uh, cosmology, what we have are what are called standard models. And a standard model is a funny thing. It's both remarkably precise and extremely irritating. Uh, it's, it's precision. Uh, means it fits a huge amount of data with only a small number of parameters. Uh, for the standard model of uh, particle physics, the masses of the particles and the strength of the interactions. For cosmology, the amount of these different kinds of stuff, the dark matter, the dark energy, the ordinary matter, uh, and then uh, simple properties that they have. So, but on the one hand, it works. On the other hand, we have no idea why it work, why it has the properties it has. It's like having a, a black box with all kinds of interconnections. Those are the equations that, that describe these models, but knobs that you can turn and you adjust the knobs and you get just the right fit to the data. But why is there so much dark matter and dark energy? Why uh, so little ordinary matter and especially uh, the kind of stuff we're made of? We don't understand. I have two questions, and I want to get to Nancy. So the first question is, um, as you know, there is a big difference between the measured value and the theoretical value on the cosmological constant. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, 120 orders of magnitude. Yeah, so, <laughs> no, no. Which one do we accept? Oh, well, obviously the measurement. Uh, we, we don't know how to do the calculation. Uh, so in, a, in the most naive way, uh, you can uh, estimate how much uh, stuff there is in the vacuum, uh, in space with nothing else in it. And according to quantum mechanics, there's constantly particles being created and uh, annihilated, created and destroyed uh, all the time. That, that's the way quantum mechanics works. And if you make a naive estimate, then you get a value for the cosmic cosmological constant, the, the repulsion of space by space, which is 120 orders of magnitude larger than what we actually measure. So that's uh, 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 an embarrassment to particle physics. On the other hand, uh, there's a wonderful theory in particle physics that if it's exactly right, the cosmological constant would be zero. There would be no, uh, and that's called supersymmetry. However, supersymmetry has to be a broken symmetry, and there's no evidence that supersymmetry is actually correct. It's the best idea we have to go beyond the standard model of particle physics. Uh, I found it very attractive. It seems likely that maybe it'll be right, uh, but we don't know. And I'll come so, back so, to so that's a problem. Uh, I'll come back uh, to that. My let, let me just question. mention the latest yeah. wrinkle uh, on this dark energy stuff is that it may be that about 50,000 years after the Big Bang, for a, a period of only about 5,000 years, there was a little resurgence of dark energy. So the current standard theory is that there was something we call cosmic inflation, which was driven by extremely large dark energy that disappeared extremely rapidly. It had an enormous impact on starting the universe off, uh, basically causing it to expand and also generating the fluctuations that grew into galaxies and all the big structures in the universe. And then it disappeared. But then 50,000 years later, for 5,000 years, maybe a little bit of it came back. It's easy to make that happen, uh, theoretically. And the reason that that's suddenly become very interesting is that the biggest problem with the standard model of, part of cosmology is the expansion rate doesn't seem to be right. The universe, if you measure how fast it's expanding, is expanding a little faster than the standard theory 
lambda CDM, the double dark theory, a little faster than that predicts. Uh, it's if, if I tell you the numbers, it'll sound like a modest uh, problem. The measured value is 73 plus or minus one. And the predicted value, applying the standard theory to the early universe, is 67. So uh, these are in the standard uh, uh, units, kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, that may not sound like a big deal, but 73 plus or minus one, that plus or minus one is the thing to pay attention to. Uh, and what that's saying is that this is a five or six sigma discrepancy. The chance of that happening is less than one in a million. This is not some kind of statistical fluke. It's telling us there's something wrong with the theory. Uh, this has been a, a growing problem. And uh, it looks like the best solution to this is this idea that in the early universe, roughly 50,000 years after the Big Bang, there was just this little bit of resurgence of dark energy, only contributing 10% to the cosmic density for that brief period. That fixes up this problem. And it makes a bunch of predictions that we worked out and published. And one of the predictions is that galaxies form much earlier than in the standard theory. We're now seeing an unexpected abundance of very bright galaxies forming only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. We're now something like 13 or 14 billion years after the Big Bang. So this is the very, very early stage of the universe. And the only way we could see these galaxies is with the help of James Webb Space Telescope. It's given us the ability to see light that has shifted in its uh, wavelengths by a factor of 10 or more. The universe, in other words, has expanded by more than a factor of 10 in all three dimensions since the light from these galaxies started on its way to us. But we're seeing many, many galaxies, very bright ones, and far more than the standard theory led us to expect. But that's exactly what this early dark energy theory predicted. That, that's what we showed. Of course, we theorists can never tell you what's true. We can only tell you, if you make these assumptions, this is what follows. The observers tell us what's true, and the observers are seeing these massive galaxies at high redshift. So maybe that's, uh, that's telling us that, that uh, there's yet another uh, weirdness about the universe having to do with dark energy. Okay, Joel, I have a lot of questions, and uh, the more you give the answers, the more difficult and incomprehensible the universe becomes. <laughs> yes. But uh, one more question before I go to Nancy, and then I'm going to come back to you about cosmic inflation and eternal inflation and all that. Um, but this one question before I go to Nancy, if the atomic universe is made of particles and particles have a dual nature, as uh, everybody now agrees. Uh, particles have units of mass and energy, and waves exist uh, in Hilbert space as mathematical entities. What does the universe, what is the universe made of? Which is the number one question in science right now. Well, uh, as I said, the universe is mostly dark matter and dark energy. That's 95% of cosmic density. And we don't know what they are. Uh, so uh, the, the short answer to your question is, we don't know. And now we do know a great deal about the other 5%. It's mostly hydrogen and helium. Uh, those are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The forces holding the nucleus together are the strong force. And the electromagnetic force repels. The protons all have the same charge, so they repel. Atoms are held together by the electromagnetic force. The negative electrons are attracted by the positive nucleus. Uh, that's all stuff we understand pretty well. We've got a theory that explains it all quite nicely. But that theory has no room for dark matter, the standard model of particle physics. So so uh, uh, we really are in a quandary. Nancy. Uh, I, I keep telling my students uh, who are, when they first learned how much we understand about the universe, they're always quite impressed. And then I keep reminding them, yeah, but we don't really understand anything at a fundamental level. And there's a lot more work for you guys to do, I tell my students. And yet uh, everything works as far as creating te technology is concerned. Yeah, well, that has to do with that 5% of ordinary matter, uh, the, especially the, uh, the hundredth of a percent of the heavy elements that uh, all of our gadgets are made of. 
So Nancy, you're the author of both books, co-author of both works, and uh, especially this one, um, I see you as the first author, The New Universe and the Human Future, How a Shared Cosmology Could Transform the World. How could it transform the world? The problems that we face in the world today, all the really serious problems are on a global scale. And almost nobody knows how to think on that size scale. So people think using their old religious values and using their, in, their intuition, which is of course entirely based on earthbound experience, their local experience, their lives, their, their evolution. So it's extremely difficult to come up with any kind of a solution to our problems unless we can think larger than they are. You know, there's this famous um, line that was that's attributed to Einstein. I hope he said it, but who knows? <laughs> that uh, you can never solve a fundamental problem at the same level at which it is posed. And this is so true of all of our, especially climate change. So how are we going to get past this? How are we going to find a way to think that could actually unite people around the world who have very, very different um, value systems, racial differences and um, blame differences as to who's, you know, who's to blame for the, the problems in the world. How are we going to be able to cooperate widely enough so that we can actually start to solve problems on a global scale? The only way to do that is to have some kind of a narrative, some kind of a story, some, some kind of an ethic or value system that is equally true for everybody on earth. And no religion is ever gonna be that. There will never be a religion that everybody agrees on. The one thing, the one and only thing that we know that's true for everybody on earth, whether they know it or not, is science. It's what science has discovered. And if we could base a narrative, not just of how things operate, but of how we fit in, how we fit into this enormous 13 billion year um, evolution of the universe, how it came about. What this is an origin story that everybody shares, not just everybody, animals, every, <laughs> everything on earth shares the same origin story. If we could present this story in a way that actually shows people how we fit into this great scheme of things and what the enormous future could be based on how enormous the past is, we might have something that would transcend our differences. We could still have all the diversity in the world as far as lifestyle and dress and even religions, but there has to be something that underlies all of it that we can actually use as, as a uniting story. And I think that cosmo modern cosmology is the first real candidate that we have for that. So my question here, um... Maybe I'll come to that later. Uh, I have a question uh, for you, Nancy. How do we fit in? Okay. Um, well, dark matter and dark energy are our ancestors. We would not be here without them. They have been engaged in this dance since the beginning of the universe where dark energy is ripping space apart while dark matter is pulling matter together. And the interaction of these two enormous forces has basically spun the galaxies into being. And the galaxies have created the planets and stars, but especially the planets without which life would not be here. So it's this enormous story that has brought us into being. And we have just, we humans, have arisen out of this planet. We are a phenomenon of planet Earth. And when we start to understand that we have arisen from planet Earth and under Earth's certain conditions that are actually pretty good compared to some of the conditions it's had earlier in its, in its um, four and a half billion years, we can start to understand that we are absolutely part of this and we need to maintain the conditions that allow us to Exist. And also, Deepak, it's so important that people realize that the way that they look at time is symmetric. People who believe that there's a very short past 
like 6,000 years, something that only happens in the United States. People who believe that cannot even conceive of a future of a billion years, 100 billion years. They, it's utterly meaningless to them. So they can't care about it. But people who can understand that it took 13 and some billion years to, to produce us, we've only been around a few hundred thousand years, people like us, out of 13 billion years. When you realize that, you realize that there could be this enormous future. And what is going to be the future of Earth? Well, it turns out that we have a half a billion to a billion years that we could still be living on Earth before the sun gets too hot. That's a huge amount of time. But in order to care about that, you have to be able to conceive of it. And that's one of the really crucial things about this modern cosmology. It really opens people's minds to such a big size scale because that actually is the size scale where the consequences of today's actions are gonna reverberate. Well, you know, right now, uh, from what I read about evolutionary theory, our senses evolved uh, in the savanna. So very large objects are, uh, are incomprehensible to us, even the idea of very large or very small, even large, fast movements and uh, very slow movements are incomprehensible to us. And so there are limits to our perceptual knowing. And all our perceptual knowing has created uh, all these theories about existence. And yet our perceptions could probably be just magical lies. You know, uh, the, my perception tells me the earth is flat. Nobody believes that anymore. The ground is stationary. It's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour. You are a three-dimensional object in the theater of space-time. But in actuality, you're proportionately as void as intergalactic space. My mind reels in bewilderment just talking to both of you. But I do have a question for Joel now. You know, I recently, uh, recently, yeah, interviewed Sean Carroll. And, you know, I was talking about the two trillion galaxies that everybody is talking about right now, which is... Uh, according to you, less than 5% of the universe, 2 trillion galaxies, 700 sextillion stars, uncountable trillions of probably habitable planets, maybe 60 habitable planets just in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's, it's very bewildering, but then there is Sean Carroll who says, no, there are infinite universes, <laughs> you know, and he's going on and on about infinite versions of you and me. And he's, you know, he, he sits on this or was sitting at the same desk as Richard Feynman. And he's one of the most credible scientists. You have spoken in, in this book about eternal inflation and you gave an amazingly interesting metaphor or analogy uh, cosmic uh, Las Vegas with the uh, infinite amount of slot machines all throwing randomly these <laughs> coins. And uh, once, because it's infinite, there's infinite chances of uh, a quantum fluctuation escaping the cosmic casino and spinning off in a universe. Please explain. Do you favor that, uh, which would be along with Sean Carroll, or what the heck is going on? So uh, ever since about 1980, when Alan Guth hooked up this idea of cosmic inflation, uh, it seemed like a, a really good idea. Uh, so when I was developing cold dark matter, our sort of modern cosmology, uh, I naturally included the, the start for the cosmology being cosmic inflation. Cosmic inflation is not exactly a theory. It's a, sort of a whole class of theories that all basically say that there was an enormous amount of dark energy in the very early universe that very quickly disappeared and converted into ordinary energy in the form of particles that make up the dark matter. Uh, the, the theory explains not only why the universe is expanding, but also the theory naturally explains why there are galaxies why the universe isn't just a homogeneous soup 
but uh, it, it's very inhomogeneous as time goes on. It started out with only small fluctuations in density from one place to another that were created by quantum fluctuations in this very early, rapidly expanding uh, inflation stage. And that's a, that's a very strong prediction that the theory makes. Uh, and it seems to be right. Uh, every time we test it, we keep finding that uh, that aspect of the theory is right. I don't know of any other theory that predicts the start of the universe the way inflation does that, that gets it right. So I, along with most uh, uh, astronomers, have decided, yeah, something like inflation must have happened at the beginning of the universe. Now, what Sean Carroll is talking about is what happened before inflation. And that we don't know. It's true that many different versions of the inflation story, as I say, there's not a, inflation is a strategy. It's a, it's a large class of theories. There are details that differ in each theory. There are a number of these inflation theories where if you ask the question, what happened before the inflation that started our universe? The answer is that the universe is very inhomogeneous and probably lots and lots of different universes are being spun off all the time maybe with different properties, different force laws, different kinds of particles, maybe even different numbers of dimensions. Our universe has three dimensions of space and one of time. It's possible that there are universes with four dimensions of space and one of time. Can't have more than one of time. That's very hard to understand. But, but you could have several other dimensions of space, uh, maybe 10. Anyway, uh, the trouble is we just don't know. Uh, for a long time, we thought that this would be impossible to test, that, that there wouldn't be any way to tell what happened before the Big Bang. But uh, my colleague, Anthony Aguirre, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and others, uh, Max Tegmark uh, at MIT, uh, and, and others, have shown that, in principle, it might be possible to detect what happened before the Big Bang. It's not necessarily a non-scientific question. In other words, it's not necessarily something for which no empirical evidence is, is going to be relevant. We haven't found any evidence yet, but there are things we could look for. Actually, let, let me uh, uh, just mention, you mentioned all of these inhabitable planets that uh, may exist in the Milky Way and other galaxies. We've just learned something uh, recently that somewhat changes our story and makes Earth seem even more peculiar and unusual and special uh, than we used to think before. And that has to do with radioactive heating. So uh, I don't want to detract from your other questions, but if you'd like me to explain that, I could do that fairly quickly. Uh, this is a fairly recent discovery that we made. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so uh, it has to do with uranium and thorium. Uh, and when I told people this story, uh, one of my friends said, that's the first good thing I've ever heard about uranium. Uh, so here's the story. It's been known for some time that something like half the heat that comes up to the surface of the Earth from the deep Earth, half of that heat comes from radioactive decay of uranium and thorium, the two long-lived radioactive elements in the Earth. They're in the mantle and the crust. The core of the Earth is mainly made of iron and, and iron group elements, nickel and so on, uh, and uh, the radioactivity is not there. Uh, the core of the Earth is extremely hot, and heat from the core is carried upward by uh, convection uh, by the motion of uh, the outer core and then especially the sluggish motion in the mantle uh, to the surface. But the heat from the original creation of the Earth that's still there in the core is only about half the heat that we get on the surface of the Earth coming up from below. The other half is from radioactive decay. Now, for a long time, we didn't know where the uranium and thorium and all these other heavy elements came from. We found that out just five years ago. In 2017, we got gravity waves from a merger of two neutron stars. Uh, if there's a star that's about 10 or 12 times as massive as our sun, it only lives for a few million years, and then it has an explosive uh, supernova end the center of the star collapses and a more massive star, the center would collapse to a black hole. But these stars collapse to what are called neutron stars. 
They have a mass of several times the mass of the sun, but they're only about as big as San Francisco. So uh, when two of these neutron stars merge, we discovered, a huge amount of these very heavy elements gets produced, something like 10 times the mass of Earth just in gold. That's where the gold comes from, from these merging neutron stars. Well, that's also where the uranium and thorium comes from. And these are very rare events, and they only pollute a fairly small part of the Milky Way when these events happen with these heavy elements. So the amount of the heavy elements is very different from one planet to another, from one star to another, and the planets around that star. So we worked out for the first time what happens if you change a lot the amount of these heavy elements, uranium and thorium. It turns out if you increase it even just a little bit, Earth would have lost a magnetic field for hundreds of millions of years. That would have had terrible consequences. Earth would have lost its atmosphere. It would have been carried away by the solar wind. And the surface would have been exposed to a very high level of, radio, of, of uh, cosmic rays. Also, Earth would have had many more catastrophic uh, volcanic eruptions, what are called flood volcanism. Those cause the two greatest mass extinction events. That's what happens if you increase the amount of uranium and thorium. If you decrease it, you probably lose plate tectonics, the moving continents, which have recycled crucial material over the history of the Earth. So it turns out that Earth has just the right amount, the Goldilocks amount of uranium and thorium. And that's and what most other planets. Uh, and that's what they're looking for, right? The Goldilocks zone. Um, well, this is the gold, we're, we're in the Goldilocks zone around our star, where water would have been in liquid form for the whole history of the planet. That that's another special thing about Earth. However, but line, do you believe there are other, uh, there's a likelihood of other habitable planets? Of course. Uh, we now know that on average, most stars have planets. And we know that most planets are not like the ones in our solar system. They're mostly heavier. The rocky planets are heavier and larger than Earth. We call them super Earths or even mini Neptunes. Uh, but, and, and most of these extrasolar planetary systems we found are much smaller than ours. The, the planets are much closer to their star, although that's partly a consequence of it being much easier to discover the planets if they're closer to the star. Uh, we'll get that straightened out pretty soon. But in any case, no question, there's lots and lots of planets. Many of them will be in the habitable zone, which means water would be liquid on their surface. Uh, but now we know that you have to look for some other things. And one of the things you have to look for is the right amount of radioactive heating, not too much and not too little. And uh, so that's uh, in the Drake equation, uh, you know, the estimate of the number of habitable planets that might be sending out signals that we can detect. This is one more term, and uh, it might be uh, a fairly small term. So it might be rather special that, that uh, we're, we're learning many ways that Earth is special, and this is yet another one. All the more reason to go back to what Nancy was saying, uh, that people should understand just how special our planet is, and, and especially uh, its current very favorable climate, which we're changing rather drastically in ways that will not be good for the future. Logically so. So second question, and I don't think we'll have time to uh, address all the questions I had. We might have to do another interview. So a few years ago, before Freeman Dyson passed away, I corresponded with him, and he, in an email, said to me that uh, three riddles had uh, occupied his awareness throughout his career. The first was a universe fine-tuned for mind and consciousness, mathematically fine-tuned for mind and consciousness. The second was the unpredictable movement of particles. The third was his own consciousness, our own consciousness. And he said he didn't have an answer to these riddles, but he think he thought they were somehow connected, which leads us to the second open question in science, which is the basis of consciousness, the biological basis of consciousness. And many people that I talk to right now say so there's no biological basis of consciousness, that biology is an experience in consciousness. It's a qualia, combination of qualia 
uh, experiences in consciousness. The question I have is, irrespective of our worldviews, are consciousness and cosmos complementarities? Hmm. Uh, well, certainly in one respect, uh, the cosmos is something that we create. Uh, that is to say, our picture of the cosmos. What we get is data. Of course, our own sensory perceptions are only good enough to see a few thousand stars. And uh, as you said, it's very hard for humans to imagine things on size scales much larger and much smaller than our senses directly allow us to perceive. With scientific instruments, of course, we can. And part of the training of science is to learn how to interpret the data that we get indirectly. But uh, this question of where consciousness comes from and uh, the consciousness of the cosmos, uh, the cosmos is something that we create, we scientists, uh, by coming up with theories that can predict what experiment and observation will show. And then, uh, as I say, we theorists can never tell you what's true. All we can tell you is, if we've done our work correctly, if you make certain assumptions, certain conclusions follow. It's the data, the observations, the experiments that tell us what's true. But then we combine all of this in uh, this amazing uh, tool that we have, this consciousness. And uh, it's, it's rather amazing that we have managed to get the understanding we have so far of how the universe works. And of course, uh, as a scientist, uh, the optimists always win in science. The people who think you might be able to understand how things work. Because if you don't think that, then you're not going to make any progress. Uh, so uh, the mystery of consciousness is uh, something you know much more about than I do. Uh, uh, before but, I go to my last question for uh, Nancy, um, after all, theories are conceived in consciousness. Experiments are designed in consciousness. Observations are made in consciousness. And even mathematics is an activity in consciousness. And it is unreasonably uh, precise in predicting the results of experiments. So I think uh, I veer towards the view that the universe is conceived, governed, uh, and comes into existence in consciousness. And it's not a local phenomenon that consciousness, like the rest of the universe, is actually non-local. But that's a whole different uh, discussion. My last question, because we cannot post this if it's more than one hour, and we're almost getting there, is for Nancy. Nancy, um, we are a speck of dust in now the junkyard of infinity that we have created uh, with all the contamination of space. And... Um, if there are indeed two trillion galaxies, then uh, planet Earth is not even a grain of sand in all the beaches of, of, of just our planet. Metaphorically speaking, we are not even a grain of sand in all the beaches. The other day I went to a beach and tried to pick up a grain of sand and a little breeze kind of um, came and it drifted off and was lost and the beach didn't notice. So now we have on this little grain of sand, a species called Homo sapiens. And uh, this species has existed only for 200,000 years. And it feels that uh, it can create models to solve the mystery of existence. There's existence and then there's the awareness of existence. Um, if there was no awareness of existence, then for practical purposes, there would be no existence. I think they go together. How do we accommodate for this grand mystery that on this little speck of dust is a species that even can comprehend or have the gall to solve the mystery of existence and the awareness of existence. Uh, I would think it leads to some kind of immense humility of not knowing. Um, 
I'd like you to comment. And I think we should close with that because without humility, both science and philosophy are irrelevant. Well, it's true that we are on one planet in this enormous universe, but it's our planet. And when we think about what matters, what matters is what matters to us who are thinking about what matters, right? So, I mean, you can say um, we're just one grain of sand, but that's our grain of sand. It's the grain of sand that matters. So, <clears throat> for example, <clears throat> You can say, now think about the person that you love most in the world, okay? Is that person just one of those kinds of grains of sand? No, because that person is more valuable to you than anybody else on the planet. And we have to think about our planet that way. This is, this is what makes us, us, being on this planet. You said earlier, that um, we evolved on the savanna. And so we only have the kind of intuition <clears throat> that are the earlier variants on the human theme, to use Robin Dunbar's word, that they had. But that's not really so because we have evolved to have these big brains that they didn't have, to be able to understand abstractions, to be able to invent religions and science, to be able to think so far beyond our experience, that it's really kind of miraculous. And we have, it's true, constructed a cosmos, but we may not have constructed the universe because the cosmos is our picture of the universe. It's not the universe, but there may be a universe out there. And frankly, from my point of view, it makes a lot more sense to assume there is the universe out there to assume that this planet is real, to assume that what's happening to the future is not all in our minds, but is really going to affect the minds and the lives of millions, trillions of people, I mean trillions, but you know, millions of people who will follow us and will either suffer or benefit from what we do. So from a pragmatic point of view, I think it's better to assume that reality is real, to assume there's a real universe out there and to ask the questions about consciousness, because obviously, you know, as you know very well, no one has understood it. But, you know, you can't get outside the universe to look at it. And so in the same way, you can't get outside your consciousness to look at it. So I don't really think there's going to be any kind of an adequate explanation of consciousness from the point of, in the way that we explain other things, which is where we like to step outside it and look at it. We can't do that. So we are part of it. We know we're participating in it. And I just feel that understanding that, that we are kind of a miracle here. The likelihood that we would have evolved is so low. There were so many crazy things that had to happen for us to emerge that we should really just incredibly be grateful. Interestingly, I read a wonderful thing because this is really a source of awe to me that we're here. And I read this amazing thing that um, some researchers, um, you know, that different emotions can affect your physical health. I mean, you're a doctor, you know this. And these researchers said, well, what emotions improve your physical health the most? And people guessed, oh, it would be joy or it would be love. But no, it turns out it's awe. The experience of awe actually improves your physical well being. Thank you to our big brains, because that's where it comes from. And therefore, um, this feeling of awe or wonder or yeah. curiosity or bewilderment, you know, there's a poem by Rumi, he said, exchange your cleverness for bewilderment. And this bewilderment is a holy experience, uh, is a sacred experience. And... I think you said it right now that the universe we know is a human universe. Um, it's not uh, the universe of another species or a different uh, nervous system. The human brain and human mind and human consciousness had to evolve for us to see what we see as the cosmos. 
And I'm reminded of this uh, poem by Tagore, Indian poet, who said that I exist is a perpetual surprise. And if you're not perpetually surprised by this, then your humanity is incomplete. So you said love matters, that special relationship matters, totally agree with you. But I would say as a physicist, Joel would probably say nothing matters. And I'm using matters as a word. <laughs> I don't think so. Nothing would matters. Would you say that, like Joel? Huh? Joel, is it nothing that becomes everything? Uh, well, uh, no. Uh, certainly uh, in this beginning of the universe picture that we have of cosmic inflation, the cosmic inflation is certainly not nothing. Uh, uh, there's some quantum field that's uh, not at the minimum uh, of its possible energy. And uh, that's uh, basically the structure of inflationary models. Uh, you have to postulate that there is some quantum scalar field, uh, which is called in the technical literature, the inflaton. Uh, there might be many such fields and particle physics can easily produce such things. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's not nothing. It's in fact, it's a rather what, complicated what something. Scientists call the singularity a thing or just a uh, superposition of possibilities. So uh, in physics, uh, in classical physics, general relativity, uh, you predict a singularity. Uh, the, the center of a black hole, for example, is a singularity. But in quantum mechanics, singularities are impossible. And in some sort of combination of quantum mechanics and gravity, singularities are avoided. Uh, we don't know how to make a combination that really describes our three spatial plus one time dimension universe. Uh, with more dimensions, nine or 10 uh, dimensions of space plus one of time, uh, you can make a theory called superstring theory that naturally unifies gravity and quantum mechanics. So that shows that it's possible, but we don't know how to use that to make predictions for our universe with three space dimensions and one time dimension, the universe that we actually observe. So uh, we don't know uh, how to fit all of these ideas together yet. We may never figure it out, but as I said, in science, the optimists always win. Uh, it's the people who think we can figure this out who are going to uh, figure it out. And maybe uh, someday we'll have a, a deeper understanding. Well, one thing that's important to appreciate is that our modern picture, this crazy double dark picture where almost all of the things in the universe are mysterious things that we don't know the identity of. We don't even know why there's so much of them. That's a fairly recent construction. Uh, it, it all was constructed in the last uh, maybe 30 years. Uh, it's entirely possible that 30 years from now, we will have a completely different picture. Uh, I hope that you and I are still around to uh, appreciate uh, uh, the, the new Our picture. very special guests have been Nancy and Joel Premack. These are the amazing books that I recommend that you look up. And uh, if awe is the most uh, primal instinct of Homo sapiens, you've certainly helped me experience more law today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Deepak. Thank you.